Good afternoon, folks. We're going to give people some time to trickle in. You're making me sweat, Brandon, not being here 10 minutes early. <laughs> I actually was. It was just we were having some technical issues with permissions. Was actually here. Valerie and I were here about fifteen minutes early. Actually, it's like I hope I'm good. You're good. You're good. But thankfully, that thankfully us being here that early was Perfect. helping us able to get us resolved that. So often reminded of Murphy's laws in this situation. All right, we are right at 3 p.m. So I'm the recording has already started. So I'm just going to go on and start us off. So first off, everyone, thank you very much for coming to our webinar today. My name is Brandon Gaynor and I'm the Acting Director of Professional Development with CBC at One. And I'm here to introduce our wonderful facilitator for this webinar, Kelly Spoon. Now, just to give you a little bit of background about Kelly, and please, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but Kelly is a professor of mathematics at San Diego Mesa College, and she's always willing to try something new and exciting. She's done things like teaching MESA's first supported statistics and calculus courses. She's played around with a variety of different modality. She's on MESA's ongoing support for teaching, and I believe she's even facilitated some webinars in the past at OTC for us as well. So you're in the hands of quite the seasoned veteran here. Now, during this webinar, we're also going to be linking to a survey for you to provide feedback. We'll be dropping a link in the chat around 30 minutes. My colleague Valerie will be taking care of that, and then roughly every 15 minutes after that. So we ask that you fill this out, not only to show us how we did, but so that we can create future programming that's more tailored to the needs of the system moving forward. Lastly, I want to emphasize that while At One does offer badges as proof of completion for our courses, we don't provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution does require proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, we ask that you remain to the end of the webinar and complete a survey, but also make sure to check that box on the Google form that allows you to request a copy of your responses. You can use that confirmation as proof of your attendance. If your college does need something more, such as official documentation from the CBC, we ask that you email support at cbc.edu and we can help you out on that as well. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Kelly and she's going to get us started. And Kelly, just so you know, throughout the webinar, we'll be monitoring the chat and posing and giving time to answer questions. But if you also want to prompt the audience and let them know that there will be time for questions, I think that typically does a lot to assuage the concerns of people in the webinar. I do love an interruption. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, I, I do my best when I'm on my toes. I, I don't have ability to share a screen right now, though. Can you? Yes, I will me? take care of that for you right now. So you are now a co-host, so you should be able to share screen. Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, perfect. Getting everything reset up again. Get my chat windows and all that available. All right. So thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Brandon. Um, and as I said, feel free if you have questions, uh, comments, anything you want to add, just throw it in the chat. Um, I am always happy to pause and just chat about something that is more interesting to us uh, as I do in my classrooms. So before we get started, I thought it might be a nice place to start is to sort of just come up with a definition of active learning. I mean, everyone here signed up to come to a webinar, a 90 minute webinar about active learning. So hopefully you have an idea, um, but I'm gonna give you a minute to type up something in the chat. Uh, what do you define active learning as? And you can be snarky, uh, you can be a little sarcastic if you want, um, this can be as short and sweet or as long-winded, you know, hopefully a minute gives you time to type this into chat GPT, have it give you an answer so you can provide it to us. Oh, 
Oh, I like that, Donna. Throwing out that sage on a stage. No death by PowerPoint. I like see snarky. They they took my instructions to heart. These faculty are good. All right, exploring concepts visually and with tech. Time for group work, student centered. These are all lovely. There we go. We got our timer finished there. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, this image, I want you to also just take a moment, type in the chat, what do you see when you look at this lovely image of these? These are students from my college. This is a classroom. We have our communications department. They're really great. They like run around and take pictures of students on campus all the time. So we can use them all in promos. What do you see when you look at these students? What are your first feelings? Just an observation. They are awake, bare minimum for being in class. They're listening, they're attentive, yeah. We've got some technology, yes. They are sitting in the back row. This is the back row of one of our classrooms. I mean, they do all seem like they're paying attention. I also think that this, yeah, they look like they're ready to participate, especially that the student right in the very front, like got the pencil ready, right? Hand on the chin, thinking. Um, but this is actually uh, one of our one of our classrooms that's more lecture based. It's just, I have pictures from the other part, but like I just thought the photographer taking this was probably going like this is a beautiful diverse set of students, right? Like this is gonna look great on some promo material, like this row really like check some boxes. Um, but the other part of that like DEI work is the inclusion, and the real question is do these students feel included, right? Um, are they really actively part of this? And so my definition of active learning um, was sort of that the students are actively engaging with the content. So they're not just actively engaging with each other, joking around, but with the content through some sort of meaningful activity. So there's a lot of design involved in active learning uh, to me. So I'm gonna give us one more time to sort of share in the chat uh, so that we have this sort of shared framework and then I'm gonna give you lots and lots of examples. Um, but our last little share out here is gonna be about how does active learning this framework, right? I like that not lecturing, not death by PowerPoint, right? Not sage on the stage, all those things you guys are putting, those snarky kind of comments in the chat. How does it promote equity? Um, so I'm gonna give you, um, oops, that timer did not start, a minute to respond to that. I will, Alex, I'll get you that link. Gorgeous. You guys have some beautiful, beautiful answers here. Um, right. I think a lot of faculty who are more lecture centered, they tend to think of their classes as being very active. But Donna sort of hit this right on the mark, right, with that comment. The student may be the only one in class who's less prone to be vocal. When you're teaching in a lecture based class and you're asking your question your questions out to the class and getting responses those responses tend to come back from just a few vocal students right and those students who are less likely to to speak up who maybe aren't as confident in their ideas aren't able to speak up but then sort of as sab pointed out everybody's involved and needed right everybody has to be involved uh, everyone gets to sh show their understanding so you all have a, a an excellent sort of list of reasons why active learning is an equity piece right that's why we do this work. Um, so I love this quote by Dan Meyer, and this is from years ago, but it is sort of right at the same time that I was making this transition in my own teaching, uh, where he said, 
his phases of his career where I started by thinking about like, here's my ideas. They're super cool. Like, did you know that when I solve inequalities, like I tend to do everything with interval testing because interval testing, which you're going to use eventually when you get to calculus. So instead of like this less and, and there's all these like weird mnemonics remembering absolute values as opposed to understanding absolute value as a distance, he would you know, it was, it was all about this interval testing. So it was my ideas. And then it was like, okay, well, math is so cool. Let me show you how, why math is cool, why it is so brilliant and fun and amazing. Um, and I finally it took 10 years of teaching, finally come to the point where I'm like, no, no. Yeah, I have great ideas. I still, I still think my ideas are brilliant. I still think math is brilliant, but it's all about how do I show students that they are brilliant, that they are able to do really challenging things and come up with these things on their own. Um, so going back to these students, right, this is the actual view of that classroom. This is that professor at the front of the, the, the room being that sage on the stage presenting. This is a business law class, uh, probably the ideas of business law or his ideas. Um, and it doesn't seem very much like the students are super involved. They are attentive, right? These students look like they're all paying attention. Uh, I think the photographer might have helped with that. Um, being present in the classroom. But the question is like, how, how could we do this and make this a little bit better? So we hit this on the head um, in terms of like, I think one of the reasons that the active learning classroom promotes equity is that it really values student knowledge. So recently Dan Meyer wrote a blog post about the everything on Twitter re like resurfaces again and again, like these little battles. And right now there, there's another inquiry-based versus lecture-based like thing going on on Twitter. And so he ha responded and said, yeah, these are two ways to teach, but like in reality, they both have some merit. And in re like the best way to think about this is either way, if you're not doing this starting with student knowledge, you're probably not doing a great job at either of the two, whether it's inquiry-based or lecture-based. Um, <clears throat> We also had someone mention belonging in the chat. I do think active learning and having students center their own ideas makes them feel like they have a place in the classroom, that their views are valid. So for me, that's a big part of it is this active learning for belonging. And if you haven't read it, um, Pamela Seda and Kendall Brown have this amazing book called Choosing to See. Um, and they give this framework for like equity in the math classroom. And looking through some of these words, I know it's a lot. I'll get you the slides, I promise, Alex. Um, looking through this little mnemonic, this ICU care, a number of these map perfectly to me to active learning, right? Including others as experts. Active learning is, is basically saying, hey, you guys can be experts. The students can be experts too. It's not just about me telling you exactly what to do. Um, it's not about me being the expert at the front of the room. It's about the students being experts. Um, it requires students assess, activate, and build on that prior knowledge, especially if you're designing activities where you're taking the last lesson and you're bringing that content into the new topic that you're teaching for that day. Um, it definitely releases control, right? I, I have to be willing to pivot and think on my feet and decide if we need more examples or something um, because I'm putting the control in the students. They, they, they are the ones who are sort of in the driver's seat when I, I mean, I've designed the activity, but they decide where that activity goes and whether it, you know, is successful or it fails. Um, and then I also think it, it does show high expectations for students um, because instead of me feeling like they are blank canvases for me to impart wisdom upon, um, I, I'm believing that they are capable of doing these challenging problem sets and things that I'm handing them. Uh, in the classroom. So uh, another reason um, is this, I think we all know, I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir based on the responses in the chat, but active learning is, is really how we learn, right? We actually have to do things and practice them to like become good at them. Like right now I am coaching my, my, my five-year-old soccer team. And if I just went out for the whole hour long practice and showed them how to like juggle a soccer ball and dribble and shoot, and they never got to touch a soccer ball, 
there will be no learning happening, right? Like they would not be able to do anything at the end of the day. And so we know this, and yet you'll see so many classrooms that you walk by, probably your colleagues' classrooms, where that's just not happening, right? They're sitting up at the front of the class, basically showing students how to juggle a soccer ball and be like, okay, go home. You'll be able to juggle a soccer ball now. I told you everything. Instead of watching them juggle, giving them the feedback, you know, we do have to do a little demonstration. We do have to show something, but we don't have, that's not the whole point of our class time, right? Um, another piece is that it's great for building students' soft skills, right? That like the ability to work well with others, to communicate their ideas, to make other folks feel listened to so that they'll listen to their ideas. There's all sorts of like, just we're, we're turning them into like good members of society and good like future employees by having them work on these skills of working in these groups of students. Uh, and then the very last uh, thing I have to say is active learning is great for differentiation. If I lecture, that lecture is going at the exact same pace for every student right, regardless. And those of us who have lectured, and when we do lecture, because I still do lecture, I'm lecturing to the middle 50%, right? That's my hope. Because if I lecture to the top 25, 75% of my class is just going to be sitting there having no idea what's happening. If I lecture to the bottom 25, I am risk losing some people in terms of them getting bored and them checking out when they actually don't know something that's about to come up. So we're kind of doing this, this, this balancing act where we know some students might be getting left behind and we know some students could probably get pushed further. Um, but when we're doing active learning, it's a lot easier to design an activity where there's some scaffolding. Where we can go over and support that student who needs that extra help. And we can push that student that is ready for the next step a little bit further. So just had to say that we had to go through all the reasons active learning was great uh, because that was part of the webinars like description, uh, but I'm sure everyone is on board because you showed up for again, 90 minutes of active learning in math. So let's talk about how we actually do that. So my roadmap for today, I'm gonna talk first about like on site. if you're in a physical classroom, what, is active learn what are some active learning strategies that I really like? I'll give you a chance to share. Um, active learning uh yeah it's, it is a five it is a 3 p.m webinar on a friday i hope you have your cocktail ready i hope you like you already have your, your it's open it's there um but yeah so we're gonna start with on site uh then we'll move to sort of like what if you're synchronous like we are right now um on a zoom and then if you're asynchronous you're just doing things online how could you kind of move into each of these modalities and keep this active learning, this like actual meaningful engagement with our content. So <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to promote some of my favorite books because that's what I do. Uh, another favorite book, and I will admit that I've like only read the intro and then like seen a lot of sketch notes and a lovely webinar by Peter Lillijal uh, is Building Thinking Classrooms. Um, so if you've heard of Building Thinking Classrooms, like throw me something in the chat. Like if, if you haven't also let me know too, because I'm, I'm curious to know, this is like all the rage in K through 12. Um, but if you're in the college sphere, ooh, good, good. Yay, I'm so excited. So Peter Lillijaw is a Canadian researcher, yes, um, who went to a whole bunch of math classrooms and just observed, tried to figure out like what was working. And then he did a bunch of like little tiny experiments to see what he could do to like get students actively thinking in a classroom. And so this um, sketch note over here on the right hand side of the screen is based on some of the research he did. He said in direct instruction, which is when a, a teacher's like, hey, here's the product rule. Here's an example of the product rule. And then up at the board, they're like, hey, here's one for you to try. Now you try the product rule. What happens? And from his spot in the back of the room, he observed that about half of the class was mimicking. What he said is just what, what we know to be true. I mean, this is why I stopped using like uh, a lot of the publisher um, homework systems is students would just, oh, here, I know I put the three over here. Like they would just follow the same pattern, but they didn't really understand what was happening. They were just like, it looks like this. Let me fill in those parts. Um, so that was about half the students. Another chunk was in this orange section. They were faking. They were like writing down, like they were, they were trying to do the problem, but they weren't really doing it. They were just like writing stuff down 
waiting for the teacher to show them how to do it. Uh, another section was students who were stalling. This is actually the section I think is the largest in my classes or when I've like, I subbed for a colleague the other day and his classroom setup was not ideal for the way I teach. Um, and I just found a lot of students, it was like 10 minutes into like, probably not 10. It feels like 10 minutes, it had probably been like a minute, you know, <laughs> it was like a minute in. And all these students, they had just written down the problem. They, they had somehow spent like three minutes writing down the problem and not had done, not done nothing. So they were just like stalling. They're like getting out another piece of paper sharpening their pencil, just doing something. Um, you know, some of the active, like, I am not engaging, like, I am just going to get out my phone because you're not teaching right now, and I paid for you to teach. And then there's this little section, this green section, of the students who are actually trying to do what we are hoping they're doing, which is reason. You just taught me something. Let me see if I can apply those concepts to this problem, not just copy, but apply the concepts. And so he's like, okay, if this is this is the small sliver of our class that's actually doing critical thinking when I do direct instruction, there has to be a better way. So Peter Lillijal gave a couple of things. And so I've taken a lot of them into my class. One is he said, get the students up, get them at vertical non-permanent services. This is a really fancy way to say whiteboards or blackboards, whatever your, your fancy is. And so I'm using, and this is my classroom, this is my students from last semester. Um, I have whiteboards on three walls, and then on, I have windows on the back wall. And then I've added these little white books, these like um, temporary white, whiteboards to my walls on where I didn't have space. And so I have my students up at whiteboards doing problems. This way nobody can stall, right? I can see exactly what they're doing. They can mimic, sure, they, but I'm bringing in, yes, I will, I will get to that white book link. Um, but they are doing so, like, th this is great. Like, I love it. Um, my students are at the boards working together. I have them switch markers. I, like, go around. I ask them reasoning. But, like, for me, the biggest thing I love about this is the ability to give very quick feedback. When I have students all working in my classroom, I can just look around the board and be like, hey, wait, wait, you guys, I think, I think you forgot your, your, this. Yeah, I got that. Um, and I can be like, oh, hey, hey, did, did you guys remember that there was a, did you see that composition of functions there? Did you, like, I'm able to just very quickly, like, hone in on the groups that are a little bit off and, like, provide them a little bit of a nudge in the right direction. Or if there's a group that's really far off, then I'm going over and talking to them. Um, the ideal thing is then you use one of those groups work to present out afterwards. Be like, okay, let's walk through this group's work or have them talk through it. Um, <clears throat> another piece of this is my students are always in what Peter Lillijal calls visibly randomized groups. So I just have a deck of cards um, and I took out all of the spades and I shuffle them. And then there's three members of each group which Peter Lillijal says is the best number to make sure that there's enough difference in opinions and like understanding, but also to make sure that no one can really hide, right? In a group of four, there's, there's that one person can be like, oh yeah, you guys, you guys are good. Bye. Um, and then the reason he says to do the visibly randomization um, is that so students know you're not like targeting them by putting them in a particular group. Um, and another piece is that like, if for some reason one student is typically the one who does all the work or is typically the one who just sort of like, they go into a group and th that group doesn't know them, right? They're not coming in with any preconceived notions about like, oh, you know, Karen doesn't typically, they're, they're just like, oh yeah, Karen, what do you think? And so like all of a sudden Karen's like, oh crap, like they don't know I'm the slacker. I gotta, I gotta actually, yeah. <laughs> and, they're like, and they're like, oh God, I gotta actually like contribute. But it's great because like there's the status that students sometimes bring into the classroom, maybe based on what they look like or maybe whatever it might be, that just kind of disappears with these visibly randomized groups. My students are constantly, and, and they all are like in it with each other. Like everyone knows everyone else in my classroom. And I tell them like, when we finish this sort of board work, y'all make sure everybody in your group is on the same page. Make sure everyone understands no one is left behind. Um, and they are really, really great in terms of like, I, I like watch them teach each other like, oh, wait, 
yeah, for this one, we needed to be able to factor. So let me, I'll show you, I'll show you quickly how to fact, like they're teaching each other those little bits of incoming stuff that they might be missing. Cause I'm teaching a, a co-requisite calc class. So I'm teaching calculus with no prerequisites at all. So these students are coming into calc and they don't necessarily have any prerequisite math class at our campus. Um, I will show you really quickly while we're here. Um, someone mentioned thin slicing. I think Cynthia, yeah. Cynthia mentioned thin slicing in the chat. So what this typically looks like, Peter Lilljal has more rules, like only verbal instructions, all, all sorts of rules. I'm a little more loosey-goosey because as I've said, not read the book. I just looked at some sketch notes and like listened to a, a keynote. Um, but I have my students like, we just like this is from the power rule day. So I'm like, hey, here's some questions. I just grabbed these from, I don't know, a website, a textbook. I don't remember where I got them. And like, here you go. Okay, now now do these ones. Right. So we went from this sort of like pretty basic power rule application. Okay, there's a coefficient. All right. That makes it a little bit, a little bit more fun. We got the constant multiple for those of us in the math side. I have one that looks like a power rule, but isn't because I'm really trying to train them to pay attention to our variable. Um, and then we've got some with fractional exponents. So we're going like, okay, now we're just same, put the fractions into math, but we're okay. So I gave them this at the board, gave them some time, went around, we discussed. Uh, there was a whole lot of pi e to the pi minus ones on the boards, a whole lot, like maybe one or two groups out of 13 realized that was a constant. And those were my students who had taken like calculus before. Uh, I was like, okay. But it was, it was a good learning moment. It was a great learning moment. And so we talked about all of these. And we, okay, okay. Let me make it a little bit harder. And said, okay, here's some more. So I'm like, okay. The, the pi x to the square root of two seems scary, but is not that bad. It's just some gross constants, right? Um, and then again, I threw in another constant just to like make sure we're paying attention. Like I want them to always be like thinking before they just start doing. Um, and then we had a good discussion because again, this is a class with no prerequisite on calculus. Like why, can, why do we have to deal with that square root? Why do we have to rewrite that as a rational exponent before we begin? And you know, what would happen if we didn't? So we had like a lovely discussion about this starting from there. Um, and then we just kept going. I'm like, okay, let's just make it a polynomial. It's like easier, but kind of harder. And you see, I'm also mixing up the notation because previously I'm saying using that prime notation. Now I'm using this different. And so I'm like constantly like, and then we had a whole discussion about the notation here and what it me meant and why it is different and what's the same. Um, and we kept going with, you know, different. And these are from just different resources. I just screenshot things and threw them into slides and said, let's go. And I said, okay, let's find the equation for the tangent line. Oh gosh, same thing, but different, right? And we just kept going where I kept mixing things up. And we spend, in my class, we probably spend an hour at least at the boards every day, sometimes an hour and a half. And the, the students don't get tired. They really, it's amazing to me that they don't. And when I ask them sometimes, would you rather have a worksheet or do you want to go to the boards? My students are like, oh, the boards. Like, okay. Let's do it. Let's go. Um, and it usually just takes taking a worksheet and then taking each of the questions out of it and putting it on slides so that I can project them at the front of the room. Um, and if you actually look at these pictures in this uh, example, my students actually have questions on the board. So I had like a stations activity where there were sta like different types of questions at each station. So they would work on one station and after like five minutes, I'd have them switch to the next station. So they were getting to, to practice different problem types um, at the boards. But that has been like the biggest game changer in my class is switching to this building thinking classrooms approach. I think initially I thought it would be really hard because it's hard to, to like give up lecture time. Um, I've been lucky I'm in an eight hour class because it's this co-rec class. Um, but even then I feel like I'm able to do a baby lecture at the beginning of like, hey, here's what we're doing. Spend a bunch of time at the boards and then like a little baby lecture at the end to be like, okay, here's what we learned. Let's do it. Let's write a couple of examples down in our notes so that we have something tangible to take away from all the learning that just happened. Yeah, so that's a great question, Angela. Like I, I tend to not, some students really want those pictures and they'll take them. I actually give them, we have a Microsoft, we're a Microsoft school. So in OneNote, I will download all of my slides and 
Uh, I will give them all of my slides and I will hold on a sec. I'm going to I'm going to make Alex happy really quick. Um, I will give them all of my slides like with solutions. So I actually give my solutions as opposed to theirs just in case because there's always that concern I get from faculty when you talk about doing something um, that has a link to my slides at the very end. And it's also a place where if you wanted to take notes and put questions, you can. Um, <clears throat> it gives students uh, an opportunity to like see the right answers. Cause I think a lot of faculty are always like, well, what if I teach? I even had a student come up to me this, this semester. He's like, okay, I'm a teacher. I see what you're doing. Like, it seems really great. He's like, but like, I really don't wanna like teach anybody in my group the wrong thing. And I was like, that's a lovely concern to have, but like, that's part of what you need to be able to do as a math student and math person is to like, I like look at an idea and decide if it's right or wrong. Right. You always have that students like, am I allowed to do this? And like, you need to figure that out. Right. Like you need to understand if that operation that you're trying to do is OK. And so like assessing someone else's work is is an important skill that I think that you should be able to work on. Um, and so and like I told him, I'm like, if you're not sure, say that as you're doing something with your group. Be like, I'm not sure if this is right. And then your group can chime in. Um, but that to me was um, a lovely thing. But yeah, so I give them two things. I give them all of the work solutions after the class in our one note. And then we do a like one page of notes after each of these like days where I will do like one of each problem type as I, as, as I see them. Like, okay, we were doing power rule. We, here's one where we wrote radical, a radical as a, a fractional exponent. Okay, here's one where we had, you know, a, a rational expression where that we had an X in the denominator. We wrote that as a negative exponent. Um, so that was that's sort of how, how I tend to give them the notes for this, but some of them will take pictures. Um, another thing I love, yes, I love that Julio of uh, the idea of taking pictures. I, I tried to do that, but then I got really uh, bad about like, because I, I want to like show it in real time and I just, I sometimes I'm bad about it. I do take pictures, they, are, they just live in my phone. And I never actually make it to one note, but maybe I will be inspired by you and be better. Um, if a student chooses to do it a very different way, I'll, I'll take a picture. Because that's the one thing I really like about the whiteboards is that my students will do problems in different methods. And you'd be like, oh, look how much clever, much more clever it was to rewrite this before you took the derivative than to use the quotient rule as it was. Um, another uh, favorite for in-class stuff is card sorts. Um, I have three favorite types of card sorts. Uh, so that's the picture that you've been seeing of a lot of my students working in a card sort. This is from um, a statistics class. And this is actually the first day that they have seen to sample um, anything. So we have just finished our test on one sample, like one proportion and one mean. And then we are moving on to two sample uh, with means and proportions. And I just gave them a card sort, which had two from the previous exam and these two new ideas on it and, and had them sort of sort them and realize, okay, it's, it's a really similar process, but slightly different. Um, but there are three types. I'm gonna actually have us play with an activity. I'm gonna make you do active learning as if you haven't already been engaging because you're excellent students who showed up at 3 p.m. on a Friday. Um, let me get you this code. There it is, but I will also throw it into the chat. Copy, control B. All right, so click on that link in the chat or, or do what it says on the screen and go to student.desmos.com. Um, I will stop sharing for a second so you don't have to look at my face, but you can play attention to Desmos. So I gotta move this away too. All right, three of you, have, you don't have to sign in, by the way. If you don't have to, there should be a like continue as guest. Yes, thank you. And I will show you what it looks like if you've never played with the Desmos Classroom or the Desmos Activity Builder. Um, I will show you what it looks like from the faculty side um, in a second, but you're gonna get to experience it as a student. All right. 
So um, as, as, a, as a note, um, I usually, if this was the first time, there's a little bit of help. To make a group, if you actually like grab a card and stick it on top of another one, it will make like a group that you can move around. Yes, and uh, as Nydia has pointed out in the chat, like these are amazing. Desmos is one of my favorites, especially because you'll see I have a lot of control. <laughs> Release control was part of the ICU care and I'm All right, we got some beautiful sets being created. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna anonymize you really quick and then I'm gonna share one of them. Ooh, okay. So first off, I'm gonna show you what it looks like on the faculty side of this. Boom. I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you. All right, so on the faculty side of this, this is what the, um, screen looks like. So I can be in a summary so I can see where every student is and who is sort of done with the activity. Um, I have a teacher side where I can basically see at a glance what you're all doing. Um, so right now I could look at and be like, okay, Ingrid, whoever is anonymized as Ingrid, these are all famous mathematicians, has sorted the cards in this particular way, right? And from here, I can do like a bunch of different stuff. I can send feedback to the student like, oh, great job. So if this was a synchronous online class or even a class inside of a lab, right? I could I could be sending feedback to students or nudging them in certain ways. Uh, another thing I can do, I'm surprised that there's a correctness thing, is I can usually take screenshots of these and so then I could share them. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move you to the next screen so you can see just how annoying I can be. Yeah, yeah. Great thing about this, is like I can tell which students ha don't have my screen open anymore if I'm in a synchronous class because they don't move. So like right now, if I unanonymize for a second, like I could see Julio is still on screen one, so like has not clicked back to that Desmo screen. So if I'm doing something in class, I kind of see where students are um, and then provide feedback from there. But this is one type of card sort. Um, I know you can't see, you can see on Desmos. I'm moving you in Desmos, <laughs> Alice. Um, I will show you later. But um, so this is, th this, this card sort was one that was like open-ended, right? Sort however you want. So the one that we had looked at, that person is sorted by odd and even degree. Um, I saw other people who had sorted by like odd and even, but with the different end behavior, depending on whether it was odd with a negative leading coefficient or odd with a positive leading coefficient. Um, another type of card start, I'm gonna move you forward one more time, two more times, I'm lying, two more times, and then I'll give you a break and we'll go back to me presenting stuff. Um, I'll give you a moment. These are kind of a pain in the butt because we don't have enough time to necessarily like work through. Um, um, but one other type of card sort, and I guess I'll share my screen in case you just wanna watch me. I'll go back to this screen. Um, this one as a, from the student view, because I can also show this as a student. This one has a correct answer. So it has different quadratics and then it has um, a table. It has a graph. So you have the algebraic, the numeric and the graphical representation for a quadratic. So if I'm going, okay, this is X squared minus nine, I'm gonna have a parabola shifted down. That's probably that one. Uh, let's see if I can find, there's the right tape. So you could go ahead and have this sort of built in. Now on the summary page, on the teacher page, this one has a correctness. So I can like on the, the instructor side of this, I can see like, oh, let me go back to anonymize. Sorry, y'all. I'm going to call you out for your bad graph matching. Um, I could go and be like, oh, okay, well, looks like whoever this is has a couple of mismatched things. So I could go in and be like, I need to talk to this student. I need to see some feedback. Okay, it looks like they just stacked up representations that don't necessarily, they didn't understand the instructions. So I need to, I need to go back and talk to them. Where like Autumn is perfectly on task and, and, and getting all of them right. They're, she's just moving a little slower, whoever this is. So this allows me at a glance to see how students are doing. 
on this particular type of activity. The last type, which I'll move you through to, um, and these are all things I do in my classroom as well. Uh, so in my physical classroom, I have just cut up cardstock <laughs> for things like this. And I have, I have activities for quadratics. I have activities for limits. I have quadratic like activities for derivatives and the function analysis that goes with them. Every activity you could possibly imagine, I got, I got a card sort. Um, but the other one I like to do, um, especially in like things that are algorithmically kind of painful and like not the best, not my favorite things to lecture through, um, are like proofs. So if I'm working on a proof, I just showed my students the uh, limit definition of a derivative for sine. So we could derive that that is cosine. Instead of me working through that or anything or having them work, through, I, I gave them all the steps of the proof and said, put them in order. Go for it. Spend some time. Think about what the order is. I'll tell you what the first thing is. and I'll tell you what the last thing is. And you fill in the rest. Right. Put these in the correct order. And so. This is a Desmos activity with that same idea, but this is what I have them do in class. And then I'm like, okay, once you think you guys have figured this out, what is the step? What was the move, the mathematical move that was made between this step and that step? Um, so this has been another, uh, I think, way that has really helped students, especially students who are struggling um, with the concepts is sort of this idea that like a proof is a puzzle, right? It's not like this, this thing where I just like pretend I understood to derive the product rule that I needed to add and subtract this, this weird thing. I, instead it's, it's more just like, oh, I can see that they did this in this step. And then this step, they like, they use the like commutative property to like do this or so like, to me, that's a lot easier for students to engage with and just sort of recognize similarity and differences between structure. Um, and it really highlights again, some communication issues as well. So I'm going to stop sharing on that screen and go back to my main screen. So sorry for the delay on that. There we go. So all that neat functionality that you were seeing on the back end as a faculty member, is that part of Desmos Classroom? Yep. Yep. So there's all sorts of lovely things. Um, I can paste students so I can tell them like what screen to be on. I can leave it open so they can go wherever they want. Um, but if I like want to be like, hey, let's talk about this, I can also do like screenshots and then collect them all and show them. Um, it's it there's a whole host of functionality and you can bring a ton of different stuff in. We've just scratched the surface, but I'm gonna have you play with some more uh, if you haven't seen some of these other features because while well, card sorts are mine, um, and no, there is no cost. Desmos is free. They did get bought out by Amplify, but that classroom stuff they've said is going to be free forever. They have promised and promised and promised that it is free. Um, it is free to us, free to students, and really amazing. And they're su super good with accessibility too, which is amazing um, in terms of like, yay. All right, <clears throat> so as I said, three favorite types of card sorts. Um, Open-ended is great when you're introducing things, you just want students to kind of notice and wonder but you want them to have something physical to do that with. Um, so you're just maybe exploring types of discontinuities or as we saw with that polynomial end behavior, sort of recognizing maybe what that's all about, um, putting them into correct categories. So I do a lot of that with those multiple representations, the algebraic, numeric, and graphical. Um, sometimes that's like finding a graph of a function, its derivative, second derivatives, so they can kind of make those, those connections. Um, and then I like the ordering when they have to do something with like a proof. I've also used it for like Gauss-Jordan elimination in a matrix. Like that's such a gross thing to go through, but like having students put it in order, much, much more manageable, much more like there's, there's just an easier entry point for a student to get into. And then a more advanced student can, get, can really play with it too. All right. So while we're here, I want to give everyone a time to share since we have some. Is there any other active learning protocol or thing that you're doing in a physical classroom that is like worthwhile that we should we should hear about? If at testing, what is that about, Donna? Uh, it's immediate feedback assessment technique. 
So they um, do the problems once by themselves. It is multiple choice, but my multiple choice are strategically chosen that I pick the answers when students do the problem wrong. So they do it by themselves, no feedback. And then the second time they do it in a group and they banter back and forth about what they think is the right answer. You can do it digitally, but you could also do it with a scratch off card, which the students um, love. And I have little peel off stickers that underneath the A, B, C, or D, if they get it right, is my emoji saying you got the right answer, but they get several attempts. And every time you take an attempt, if you get it right, you get full credit. If you get it wrong, try again. If you get it right, you get half credit. And then the third time, half credit, because it's four choices. And they love discussing that. It's the only time when I give a test that they don't leave early um, and that they're arguing back and forth. And then when I make mistakes on the multiple choice, they'll come and tell me, we think you're wrong. So I love it. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I, I do love when you have a, a multiple choice that you know is going to be tricky for students, right? Those those ones, especially in stats. Stats has a lot of space for those things where intuitively, like the, the intuition is just wrong. And so you're like, hey, think about this. And you're like, talk, discuss with the neighbor. And there's always a couple of students who like figure it out, but and they have a hard time convincing the rest of them that they're right, that they actually know what's going on. And I use digitally, I use Top Hat, which allows them to answer it three times because they get feedback just on that one question. I don't know if you can do it on Canvas. I mean, you could do a Canvas quiz, but it doesn't let you do one question at a time, which is why I've gotten angry at Canvas quizzes. Yeah. And you can't get feedback on if you got that one wrong before you go to the next one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I'll show you guys some of the ways that I've gotten around what Donna's talking about. Yeah. Because I used to do all of my like content instead of a Canvas quiz and like, but I want them to get feedback immediately on terms of whether or not they got something right. This is lovely. I hope you guys are throwing all these great ideas into that uh, shared document that I didn't drop until way too late. Um, but that's fine. I'm sure someone is going to save this chat going to live on forever. All right. Um, so, oh, another one I was going to say is I, I actually, gallery walks are like underrated. I like them. I like a gallery walk in a math class. If we can have students like each create something and then do a gallery walk and sort of compare and contrast, I do like a gallery walk from a student, like having the students create stuff, not the gallery walk in terms of me making something and having all the students look. That's exactly what I do, Alex. That's exactly what I do. Um, but I'll show that to you guys later. So if you don't know what Alex is talking about with the embedded questions with H5P, I've got you covered. Um, so in a Zoom classroom, I think the most obvious thing is uh, Desmos. Uh, I use a lot of Desmos. Um, I've done breakout rooms with like Google Slides and breakout rooms with Shamboards. And this was like back before Zoom had this great functionality where we could like spy on the breakout rooms quite so easily. Um, and so what I would like one time I just remember popping into room being like, oh, my God, everybody's in here. Camera off, like not talking like nothing is this is just a room of people taking a break, wait until I call them back. <laughs> so this is part of the reason why I sort of switched gears and went more Desmos, um, because I could really see what page they were on. I could see them typing in real time and give each person feedback. Um, Though I do think there is a lot to be said for the collaboration of a breakout room and having students, um, yes, and like creating some sort of artifact, right? So as Eva put in the chat, like it, it's about the like artifact that they're making. And so hopefully they engage, but there's still going to be the potential for a, a sort of straggler in there. But um, one of my favorites for Zoom in general, and if I had been a little bit better, let's see if I can even do it now on the fly. Oh yeah, here we go. Nope. You guys have some polls in here, but none of them are what I want. And I don't think I can make a poll because I'm not fancy enough. All right, so we'll just have you. <laughs> so normally I would, if this was my Zoom room, I'd have a poll with which one doesn't belong and you could vote. I'm not gonna make Brandon make a poll on the fly. I'm not gonna assume that sort of Zoom wizardry. Um, but if you want to vote in the chat, um, which, which of these cats doesn't belong? Who are you kicking off the island? Do we post it right here in the chat? Yeah, what? post in the chat because I don't have a poll. I'm sorry, Donna. But yeah, it'd usually be a poll so you could be anonymous. Wouldn't know they were throwing classic under the bus. All 
All right. No one, no one's going to, thank you. Thank you. We got some C's. Ooh. Oh, Lynn, Lynn's adding eight reasons. No one's going to vote D off the bus. So, <laughs> thank you, Svetlana. All right. Anyone want to share why they voted for their particular cat? <laughs> because he's asleep. What is the thirty dollars? But that's why I picked you. <laughs> no idea. These lovely stat cards are made by like I think Anna Ferguson from New Zealand, and these are actually all cats from like, like people I know in like the stats world. Like one of these is Alan Rossman's cat, I think. Like there's a bunch of cats in here that are like belong to people I know. Um, I have no idea what the yes no means. I I grabbed these off of a website forever ago. And I have forgot. I don't know what anything means. Um, we can guess that like male and female is the, the sex of the cat. Uh, and that four years is probably the age. White seems to be like a color of the cat. But yeah, some of it I don't know. Uh, and so I'm like, oh, I should probably go find that lovely blog post I stole these from. Um, but the real thing is th this particular protocol, which one doesn't belong? Has anyone used a which one doesn't belong? Uh, no, or have a reason why this might be a lovely thing to do in a class? if not with cats, but with other things. Oh. There is no one correct answer. So yes, that's, that's basically what it comes down to is what Alice said, there's no correct answer. So you can't be wrong, right? Students are so parallel, paralyzed by the idea that they might be wrong. They might make a mistake. They might look like a fool, but like, there is no wrong answer. I've done this in my uh, stats class with like box plot, histogram, stem plot, trend, oh, dot plot. And I had someone just be like, histogram doesn't have the word plot in it. I'm like, that is astute. That is correct. Yes. That is a clever reason to throw the histogram under the bus, right? Not a reason I would have thought of, but like still a good reason. And so having these which one doesn't belong, it really just students get to think and they can think outside the box too. And so this happens to be the a question I use very first day of my stats class. Is this which one doesn't belong? Be like, hey, this is us already analyzing data, looking at data, right? We have this data about cats. I don't know what half the data means, but we have this data about the <laughs> outside the cat box, this data about cats. Yeah, so, and I've done this. I did this just the other day in my, my calc class. Um, these are all e to the 2x, just written different ways. And I had them tell me which one didn't belong. So they all had to like sit there and chat with their neighbors. I did it as a think pair share. So they all, I gave them time to think. And then I said, okay, now talk to somebody next to you and let's share out. And then after that, I said, okay, and now determine based on the structure for each of these, what method would we be using to find the derivative of these, right? So we got a chain rule, we got a product rule, we got a quotient rule, and then we've got just like a basic derivative rule, right? You'd have to use the B to the X or whatever you want to call that derivative of a, an, an exponential. But like every one of these uses a different rule, they'll all land us at the exact same answer of 2e to the 2x, but just different methods. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> so we already saw Desmos. This is how you get to the activity builder. You can get there from Desmos's main page as well. But I just go to teacher.desmos.com. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of other features within Desmos now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back that uh, activity. In fact, I'll just drag it over here. Um, I'm going to move us over to what a which one doesn't belong would look like in Desmos. So if you want to minimize my screen and go back to the Desmos, you can actually play around with this. If you want to just watch me because you don't want to be active, I guess I'll give you that option. But this one, I'm in the student view, and we have this lovely, like, you can put a dot wherever you want and then explain. So I've got three or four different rational functions. Uh, you could put your dot wherever, and then you could write whatever your reasoning is. And you can see where everyone else voted. So this is another really cool feature within the activity builder. It does require that you like typically find someone else who's coded up something beautifully. Um, but that is that you can actually have these like interactive where students are seeing other students votes or students are seeing these other things that people have said. Um, 
So we can see right now, most people are voting for this particular function right here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna move us forward one more. This one is just uh, asking if you've used Desmos before, a little more data collection. I can't vote because obviously, I don't mean to brag, but but you'll notice that if you click these, different things happen because again, someone has coded in here a bunch of different like if then statements essentially. Like if you choose this, like versus. So if you haven't voted, go ahead and do so just so we can get that. We have I do have a, a nice little bar graph later on. But um, another thing that's great in Desmos. Um, you can do all the things you can do in a Desmos graph. So those beautiful sliders and animations, you can put those into your Desmos activity, right? Because Desmos is Desmos. Um, and so you can have your students like start thinking about, like I can draw as many times as I want a limit as we approach one from the left-hand side. And it's just students, I'm t they do not, they do not know what you're talking about. It doesn't matter how many times you draw it, how you move in the dot, you move in the pen, you're up there doing this a, like a hundred times and they just don't get it. But like, they see that little dot moving. Somehow it just clicks for them, right? So you can build these things into, into these activities. Um, they also have a sketching tool. So you could have students sketch a function that approaches two different values as x approaches negative four. So you could have them like sketch it. Oh, that was that was real 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 sketchy with my pen with my mouse. Um, and so Alex asked a really good question. Does it have a public repository? Like, could I find this and copy it and paste what other people have made? Um, they have a bunch of things that they vetted that fit the Desmos like way. Um, and the Desmos way is great, but it does, the easiest way to do it is to just be like, what's something you're teaching right now, Alex? Oh, I don't, I don't even teach mathematics. Oh, uh, fine, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, somebody throw in a math idea, some math topic. It could be Alex, it could be somebody else. We make Alex think of some math stuff. There is like a whole language teacher section on Desmos, hypothesis testing. Hypothesis, oh my God, if I could type, this would be way better. Testing, site, teacher.desmos.com. Usually I put parentheses around it. I'm a little sketched out by me not doing that. Oof, yeah. So Desmos has actually used to be really good to search this way. Um, then they did something with their indexing for some reason and it's gotten really crappy. Um, so they said they're going to fix this. They said they were. This was on Twitter. This was like a, a couple of weeks ago. People were mad. And apparently they haven't fixed it yet because this used to be the way I would do it. I'd search hypothesis testing and just put site teacher.desmos and I'd find like 20 different peoples and then I would open them all and just like figure out which one I liked. Um, know that I have meticulously curated um, a ton of different collections. So if you want anything, just reach out to me. I probably have a collection. You want like some like trig stuff? I got you. You want calculus stuff? I got you. You want stat stuff? I got like 20 different collections. I can hook you up with like collections that I have saved of other people's stuff that you can play with. Um, Cause yes, but it should be in that, it, it should be something you can search through advanced Google searching. It's just, they they broke something on the back end. Um, <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna do one more. Um, it really depends how much coding you need to build your own. Um, technically not much. You can build a really low key one with not much. Like you can bring in a picture, you give them the little like multiple choice. In fact, let me just quickly show you. Like I said, I'm adaptive teacher dot Desmos. Oh, come on. Um, if I want to do a custom activity and create a new one, uh, example for webinar, create. Come on. All right. Um, it, like basically, here's your blank space that you can put whatever you want. So you can be like, hey, I want to put a graph in here. You can put a graph in. Typically, you might want like, oh, I would like to write something to them. Look at the graph. Uh, and then I'd like them to say something. And you can even have it show their responses to each other. 
right? So you can make it a little more interactive. So it's basically you just click on these things to like, oh, I, I want a checkbox. You do have to make sure that like, it's kind of annoying the checkboxes are just the checkboxes. They don't have anything text. You have to put like a text box of like what they're selecting before the checkbox. Um, the one thing is though that none of this gives that feedback. Like as Donna was saying, the nice thing about her AT testing, like th there's that feedback piece before you go on, right? So there's a lot of folks that have like self-checking and it's easier to just find somebody who has a self-checking, copy it and then edit it to your way. Um, but like I said, I, I can, I got lots of resources if that's what you want to play with. Um, okay, so that was Desmos. Oh, there was something else I want to show you in Desmos. One more thing. Um, not the example for the webinar. Yes. So I don't know if we want to get all the way into it, but I love the last thing you can add to this activity builder, which is a polygraph. So a polygraph, polygraph, polygraph. So a polygraph shows every student 16, whatever the hex you want. These could be images. You could just type in math text. Like you can choose anything. Like they don't have to be math. You could just like take pictures of things, throw them in there. It's basically guess who. And in a synchronous class, it matches students up as a pair. So after you go through a couple of practice rounds of like, hey, if you were not a child of the 90s and you didn't learn how to play guess who, right, then, then it'll teach you what guess who is. That yes, no questions, right? Like does your person have glasses? those questions. And so then you'll watch students go through and like ask questions of each other. So like right now, ooh, Ingrid and Christina, go, go, go. <laughs> so like those two faculty have now been matched up with each other and are playing guess who about these trig graphs because I happen to grab a trig graph one. But as a faculty member, once um, the guests are, I shouldn't have shown the thing. Once Christina asked a question, it would show up. And so as a faculty member, I love to use these when we're first seeing a function family for the first time, because I can then look and see the, the word, the vocabulary that students are using. So I use this in stats when we like look at histograms for the first time. So you'll see students being like, is it big on the right? Like, what the hell does that mean? What does big on the right mean? They just, they, 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 cause they're trying, they're struggling to come up with ways to describe this graph. They don't have the vocabulary for, right? Not yet. And so I, I'm on the back end, um, the slide thing, this thing, I think. Um, I'm on the back end when students are doing these, looking at these questions. Ooh, like, does the graph pass through the origin? I'm like, hells yes. And sometimes I'm just calling out little helpful things like, oh, I like this question. Because then everyone's like, oh, that's a good one. I'll ask that one, too. Um, but usually I'm just kind of silently grabbing and screenshotting these and bringing them into the slide and then organizing them like while students are playing. Because I'm like, OK, look, like these questions. OK, more than three peaks. Hmm. We're like coming up with all of these ways to talk about this. And then I'm like, especially with the stat stuff where we don't have a lot of language, I'm like, oh, this is really a way to talk about modality. Or, oh, this student's really getting at symmetry. So I'm kind of putting them into these groups. Then we get the vocabulary in a little lecture. And then they, they always want to play again now that they have vocabulary. They're like, can we do that again now that we actually know what we're doing? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, we can do it again. Don't worry. Um, so I love, oh, look at that. Amplitude greater than two. Bringing a tear to my eye. Use some math language. Let's hope you have a math instructor. You're not paired with somebody some interloper from chemistry. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that, that is one of my favorites. And it's, you can do it for anything, anything you want images of. Um, it could be, like I said, math. It doesn't have to be a graph. It could be anything at all. Um, and then I will stop pacing you so you can go wherever you want. I will go ahead, show you that we do have, we have a lot, of, we have a one LeBron of Desmos. Uh, we have somebody who's pretty good at it, but then we've had a couple people who've never used it or have only used the graphing calculator or really haven't used the activity. So I'm glad I was able to show you this tool because our final little spiel, right? We, we've made it to our, our last piece I want to talk about, which is taking it to campus, right? If, if I'm a fully online class, what does my fully online class look like? Because this is a lot of synchronous stuff, right? And 
one thing is I love Zaretta Hammond's structure for intellectual, pro like I think she calls it uh, something processing, information processing. Um, she says, you start by igniting curiosity, right? So every one of my, every one of my modules, I start usually with a Desmos activity that has a little bit of a reveal after each slide, right? Or something where I'm just sort of building that curiosity through like that little moving point. What do you think that means, y'all? Um, another key I use in that Ignite a lot is um, from this Choosing to See book, that, that the, the book by uh, Kendall Brown and Pamela Seda is um, instead of saying just what do you notice, what do you wonder about a graph, I, used, I would start with like a discussion board in my pre-calculus class. It would be like write down five things you know, like giving them sort of that tangible number, like what are five things you know about this graph? And like what's one thing you wonder or two things you wonder? sort of pushing them to be curious after they sort of have done that, like, hey, there is existing knowledge, right, that I can I can link this to. And that was always as a, a discussion board where they would have to post before they could see other people's, right? So they're kind of thinking about things. Um, then I chunk up my not like the actual content, and then we come back and there's usually a, like an auto graded quiz and then another Desmos activity. So I do a lot, of, I lean pretty heavy on Desmos activities um, because I think they're really hard to like chat GPT. It's just so much of a pain in the ass to go back and forth. And then usually I can have something moving or manipulating on the screen where you really can't, you, you gotta just do it, right? Like you have to play around. And it's more about what you're thinking is than it is a correct answer for a lot of it. Um, and then they finally, and, this is my stats class, they do have a discussion board where they link the content to their lives in some way. So in this case, they have to figure out um, how stats is related to the field that they're interested in or something they're interested in and come up with observational units and variables for their, their interested field. Um, <clears throat> um, I think Alex maybe mentioned the H5P. So I've also built in, uh, in that chunking in my content um, I want students to be actively engaging when they're in my online class. So I tend to use a lot of H5P so that students have these little knowledge checks built in. So as they're moving through a page, they can check and see if they got a question right or not, and they can retry it. Usually they have, oh, there you go. Like usually they have feedback. Usually I'm pretty good and give them feedback. Um, like, ugh, that one. Yeah. So then it gives them that feedback uh, of what they're doing. Um, H5P is just interactive HTML. It's not secure in any way. So like students could hack, like look at the code and figure out the right answer to these things. So it's not like you want to use it for real assessments. Um, but this is all powered through LibreText or Libre One, which is free to us at the California Community Colleges. Um, but it's just, as Donna said, the annoying thing about Canvas quizzes, is I like, couldn't give students feedback on a particular question before they moved on. And so they might misunderstand some important topic that they needed to then go do the next thing. And it was very annoying to me that I, could, I couldn't give them like that feedback right away of like, no, no, you need to relearn that. Um, you can also do that within like a My Open Math. My Open Math has the ability to like grade individual questions before they move on. Um, so yes, but um, again, happy, happy to help um, with anything like that. Yes, it's it's great. Um, and then Libra One supposedly, I haven't gotten it to work in two ways, but supposedly now you can bring in My Open Math, WebWork, H5P, and uh, QTI files from Canvas and use them all together and like one authored text. So um, that's it's an idea that like if you have Canvas quizzes already, you could like bring them in maybe and use them in some way. Um, but I've had some issues with that. Um, <clears throat> so. We're almost at the end, and I, I, I was told to give you guys time for questions, though you've been very good, and listen to me and ask questions as we went. Um, but I did want to give you a couple of uh, um, instructional moves that you could use as you're thinking about this. One is, for me, a big barrier in terms of active learning at the beginning was time. We have so much curriculum to cover Every time I go to a stats workshop, I'd be like, oh, my God, these activities are so great. But I just don't have time. I can't even get through ANOVA and I'm supposed to like I'm pretend like I'm I'm I'm, I'm getting through ANOVA. Um, but somebody was like, flip your classroom, put your videos online. We all have videos now. Put your videos online, have students come in prepared and then the activities will support that. Um, and to me, 
I'm almost to the point now where I don't even feel like I need that flipped classroom. It might just be right now that I'm in this co-rec class. Um, oh, yes. Thank you about pay, like, play pause it note. Uh, play pause it is great. It is free through something. Um, and uh, it allows you to embed even discussion boards into a video. So if you have video content, you can embed discussion boards, questions, open like open ended multiple choice. It's it's a little bit of a learning curve, but it is truly a really powerful tool. Uh, another one is Perusal. If you have anything like Perusal now takes in videos, takes it. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in Perusal also, but that's paid. So, you know, um, but so flip classroom as a first approach, but I will say eventually you might even find that you don't you don't even feel like you need the flipped classroom anymore. Like you're, you're getting, you're making activities that are deep and, and, and meaningful enough that you don't need them to come in with having watched like two, three hours of lecture. Um, I find uh, explaining the motivation for an activity is super useful. Like some students, they have a little bit of trouble buying into the idea that collaborative learning is really going to be something to help them be successful. And so you have to explain, there's a lot of research and science and, behind this and I have I've chosen this activity for this reason um, and then the last is as students are working whether you're in camp like on campus on Desmos in a live session or in an online class your job as an instructor besides to give feedback as you see students working is to really find those students and highlight their voice, right? Those students who may not speak up during class, especially, but like who are maybe not as confident and being like, oh my gosh, that was such a lovely idea. Can I, can I share that with the class? Like, oh my goodness, I loved this question that I just heard in this group over here. It was so great. Let me, ex let me, can, let me reshare it. And so I do that in my class, like as students are working, not only am I giving feedback to those groups, but I'm trying to listen for those students who, I know need that confidence builder to like feel good about themselves as a math person and just being like, oh my gosh, I just heard the most amazing thing in that group over there. Let me explain how, let me just say what, how it was that this student explained it to one of their group mates and like resharing that. And I do the same thing uh, in my online classes. I try to take a good student work from a discussion board and I share it in that week's announcement. And actually keep a roster where I keep track of every student that I've highlighted. So I try to make sure that I'm not like that I'm getting everybody by the end of the semester of like, okay, here was this really great thing so and so said in the discussion or, oh, so like this was a, so I'm just constantly trying to highlight student voice. And again, making it about their brilliance more than it is about my brilliance or the brilliance of say math in particular. Um, so that's really all I have. There is my email address. I did put it in the chat, but there it is as well. Uh, and I did put some resources at the very end. Um, my friend Charity Watson is like main author on this lovely paper about how active learning makes a huge difference in a calculus course for even students with low pre-calculus proficiency. Um, I am writing a blog series right now um, for the California Acceleration Project on my correct calc class because I'm just loving every moment of it. Um, and then in case you wanted some which one doesn't belongs, I threw those in there as well. Um, but anything else you have to share? I would love to hear any other questions. I raced through that. I just, I couldn't type it fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> this excellent presentation, you covered a lot of ground, but I didn't feel like I was lost or left behind. And thanks for introducing to classroom with Desmos. I never did it because I thought it cost. Oh, no. And I appreciate you, Donna. If you are, you, you know, that student that was like camera on and Zoom smiling at you and nodding that I, without you, I don't think I would have made it through. I needed you. I needed you here. Um, thank you all so much. I am a resource, so feel free, email me. I do office hours for that like Calco requisite blog on Thursdays from noon to one. So if you ever want to like stop in, go find my office hours. Like I'm just sitting around helping people on Zoom. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I love to share and I love to collaborate. And it sounds like you guys are doing amazing things in your classroom. So I'd love to hear about it too. All right, are there any other questions for Kelly? We do have plenty of time to address questions. Or start your weekend. Oh, Julie. Thanks, Kelly. I typed this in the chat as well. 
but I would love to hear more about which active learning activities are going especially well or which you've had success and failures both with in the co-requisite class because of the big project that our department, like many others, are now undertaking and thinking about. So that class is where I really started that building thinking classrooms framework, like using those thin sliced questions at the whiteboards all around the room with the visibly randomized groups. And I think that has been the biggest like thing that's helped students. Like I have so many students who now like are, are working together in their, their Calc 2 classes. Like they come back and see me and I see them in the STEM center. And like that, I feel like that really built a community and really got them used to tackling problems that were like maybe they were unfamiliar with because I just kept tossing harder and harder things at them because I'm a monster. So I think that was probably the biggest. Erin, and then I will address Angela. Thank you. Um, I We're still working on our co-requisite model. I'd love to hear about how your co-requisite works, who, who ends up in the class, um, is everybody yeah. in the class also like in the co-requisite? I just, I would love to hear a little bit so more your model. We are just usurping this, Brandon. We are moving from active learning to co-rec calc and I love it. All right. So our co-requisite class is a, we linked our, our five unit existing calculus course with a one unit lab course of a refresher. So it ends up to eight hours of contact time. Um, it is taught where it's just eight hours of contact time. So we don't okay. have like it's technically scheduled where there's my Friday is three hours of remediation, but I'm just teaching calculus. It's the just whole time. fluid for the whole thing. Fluid, fluid. Yeah. And okay. like I was I was even thinking like that teaching my coaching my kids soccer team like U.S. soccer was like play, practice, play, which is like have them in a game situation, ask them leading questions, then practice the stuff they need to answer those leading, and then go back to play. That's kind of my calculus class in a nutshell, right? Like, here's the calculus. Like, okay, we'll talk a little bit about the the, the skills you needed. Here's calculus again. Like, we don't, yeah, yeah I'm not really ever doing just, here's a pre-calculus worksheet. Yeah, I guess that was more my context with the active learning is like, you're not just doing that in what's designated as the co-requisite piece, but you have just effectively spread it across. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Yeah, so it's it's essentially like every every day is like, Starts a little active learning, maybe a baby lecture if I feel like it's necessary. And then we're like at the boards for an hour and a half and then a consolidation. And then we're like either out or like practicing again. Um, cool. We got the link up. Um, what was the other question I saw? Angela. Oh, tips for co -rec. Oh, and the other question to answer because Aaron's and it also I think aligns with Angela's question. For my co -rec calc class, I, I don't. I don't agree with the RP group. I don't think that every student can be successful in a co-rec calc class. I do tell my students at the beginning, they need to have some incoming out algebra knowledge, like, and then also be willing to work for 10 hours a week outside of class. So it's, it's very much like, that's my day one spiel. Like we start with like lines and parabolas and doing them thin slice at the boards where it's like, hey, graph this line, tell me eight things about it graph this parabola, tell me eight things about it. And we're going around having that conversation. And then we do the, uh, uh, Desmos about polynomials. Um, and I'm like, if any of this seemed like just completely wild, to, like this was just beyond anything that you, you felt like you were comfortable with, let's have a conversation because this might not, you maybe need to be going into our option D, innovative course um, for before you head into calculus. So um, I, do, I do think, if they have gaps, I, we can we can overcome it. It's just not a, I can't teach you all of all the things and calculus in one thing. Angela. Hi. All right. I, I love that you're talking about this because that is um, based on what I was wondering because this is our first go around doing pre-calc with a co-rec. So it's three hours twice a week. Um, and it's the first time there's no prerequisites, right? They just come on in and... I love active learning. I've been doing that for quite some time now, but I struggle with how to keep the class moving forward when I have, you know, a big chunk of students or even a, a chunk of students, right? That just clearly are not comfortable with the material that had come from before. So I wanted tips on how to keep it going because I feel like I get behind. I think 
the the I mean when you say active learning are you doing the the whiteboards around the room like that type yes. of active learning yeah we're and up it's on the same the boards questions too do they seem like they're struggling at the boards because my students never seem like they're struggling at the boards um there are groups right so yeah. I I have if I specifically choose them well right instead of randomly I could grab a student that gets it and then I could grab some, a middle student and then a student who is just struggling um but when I do random I seem to catch to get a group or two that are mainly students that really need a lot of extra help. Interesting. Um, so See, I haven't found that as much in mine. When I, when I do randomized groups, I seem to always get lucky. And the fact that there's like the ideas around the room is they can kind of borrow and then yes, ask like yes. the group next to them. I do also have an embedded tutor and she ah. is really amazing at like when there is that one group that's a little bit struggly because I've never had like more than one. She'll go up and like kind of almost reteach them something at that moment. Okay, so um, there's two of you. Yeah, there are two of okay. us. We only have 36. We have a lower class cap. She does extra sessions and she sits in my lecture and calls me out whenever I like say some vocabulary or whatever. She's like very good about it. like, oh, Kelly, what do you mean by it? And I'm like, I like make a big show of like, oh, fine, Allie, I'll explain it again. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's amazing. Um, so I'm very lucky to have her in my classroom. Okay. All right. So right now we have an embedded tutor for the last hour. Ooh, so that's yeah. much easier. Yeah. But yeah. that means for two hours, I have them up probably for an hour and a half of it working on stuff. And I feel like I can't run around fast enough to keep the whole class moving forward and get through the material fast enough because of those few groups that, and I randomize from different areas, clearly. Yeah. Right. So. And I would say the other thing I, I, I do, I have spent time. And so like, sometimes my embedded tutor will actually make them, we, we do make videos of like, Hey, here's the stuff. Like if you are on the weaker, like you are on the less incoming preparation side, here's what you need to know coming into this week. Like we're going to do chain rules. So you under, need to understand composition of functions. Like uh, here's, so we, I, we give them like these sort of like, uh, I give them, a set of problems in our homework system, if they want to work through them, they're optional, and a set of videos, but I link it to the calculus. So it's never just like, hey, here's composition. It's like, we're about to go into the chain rule. And in the chain rule, we're going to decompose a function. So you need to understand. And so I give them that ahead of time so that everybody in all of my videos and everything content are online ahead of time. So I tell my students, if you are struggling, you should be watching those videos before you come to class. And then when you come to class, class is a lovely review. Um, sure. And so we're pretty good at like capturing those students. And, and I've heard them telling each other like, hey, if you watch our videos before class, this is like super easy. You're like, oh, try the question. Like, so they'll, great. they'll tell each other, yeah. And where do you send your students that on day one are clearly not anywhere near ready for this? Sadly, thing? none of them said this. <laughs> no, 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 one, no one left so I didn't get any drops um I would you send have a them, class do you have well, a class to send them to I would have sent them previously to our college algebra with support I wouldn't have sent them to that's not even in our sim pipeline I just think that the algebra skills matter more than the trig skills or the pre-calculus skills like if they understand the algebra we can do things like we can figure out everything else um so that's where I would have sent them but now we'll have think you know, maybe an innovative course that they can go to. Is that uh, innovative course, the non-STEM major course? No, that'll be for the STEM. So we're, we're, we're oh. revising a pre-calculus. Oh, so you're doing course. what that AB 1705 is suggesting you do. We were trying to figure out what innovative is. So we might be reaching out to you. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody's trying to figure out what innovative is. <laughs> but yeah, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying. To, I mean, I know a couple of colleges that are going option A that are like, yeah, cool. Let's just see how it goes. They're That's braver than I am. You. But yes, reach out. All right. Do we have any other queries for Kelly? Well, then Kelly was gracious enough to also leave her email in the chat as well if you want to reach out to her. And we're just going to go on and move towards wrapping up. So once again, thank you all so much for gracing us with this time on a Friday at 3 p.m., seeing that we had 40 plus attendance, not including the presenter and staff was a very nice surprise. Now, once again, please look to the chat for the survey link and complete it. Valerie will be dropping that in again if she hasn't already. The survey is again set up to allow you to receive a copy of your response, which can be verification of your attendance. 
Again, if you experience any issues or you need some type of additional verification, please reach out to support at cbc.edu and we'll get you taken care of. Lastly, we hope that you register for some of the other webinars that we'll be offering throughout the term. I'll drop a link in the chat shortly after I'm done talking, but we have a robust suite of webinars across a wide variety of applicable topics, not just subject specific ones that we hope to see you all at. And we did see a couple of questions that chat about when will the slides be up and will the recordings be up. The slides Kelly's posted a link to, but we'll also get that from her and have that up on our site. The videos are taking a bit longer because we want to make sure that they're captioned properly and accessible to the widest possible audience. While we won't send those directly to folks, just periodically check back up on our site. I assure you we're moving as fast as we can on that one, but as I'm sure you can imagine for a 90 minute webinar, there is uh, with multiple people speaking, that is quite a bit to do. So thank you all once again for showing up and I hope you have a wonderful weekend and rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Donna, for your lovely